Wild, Willie Trognitz once committed an act so violent he received a lifetime ban from a pro hockey league. But in the 1970s, that act of mayhem would earn him a promotion and a major league hockey contract. But a much more meaningful achievement would come later in life, when Willie was honored as a Canadian hero for an extraordinary act of courage. This is the incredible story of Wild Willie Trognitz, a tale of bloodshed, intimidation, and the eventual redemption of one of hockey's most notorious enforcers. Born in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Raymond William Trognitz grew up playing a belligerent style of hockey in a town that would produce its share of tough hockey players such as Battleship Bob Kelly and Billy Goldthorpe. Willie's two-fisted approach earned him a feared reputation with the Thunder Bay Vulcans in the Minnesota Thunder Bay Hockey League in 1971-72, and his aggression was noticed by the NHL's California Golden Seals, which overlooked his modest skill set and chose him in the sixth round of the 1973 NHL Draft. After training camp, the Seals dispatched Willie to the lowest rungs of minor league hockey, first the Southern Hockey League and then the International Hockey League. Trognet seemed doomed to a career on buses and $3 a day meal money as a box office attraction in such towns as Dayton, Toledo, Charlotte, and Columbus. In his three plus seasons in the eye, he accumulated 827 penalty minutes and two suspensions in 215 games. His minor league coaches, especially Ted Garvin and Toledo, had little interest in developing Willie's skills. Ted Garvin used me as an attraction at the gate, as a sideshow, said Trognitz. If the situation was such that the crowd was quiet, they were booing us or something, he'd sit me on the end of the bench, then he'd look over and say, OK, Willie, go out there and start something, if you want your job. Trognitz was best known in Toledo as playing left wing on a line with equally notorious enforcers Paul Tarantadini and Doug Mahood on a line called Murder, Inc., that roughhousing trio helped the gold diggers to an improbable 1975 Turner Cup championship, remembered by Toledo fans as the miracle on Main Street. But Trognitz grew tired of this often cartoonish one-dimensional role as a goon and was traded to the Columbus Owls in 1976. By 1977, Columbus had moved to Dayton, Ohio. In five games into the 1977-78 season, Dayton squared off in an October 29th game with the Port Huron flags. The game, however, was secondary to the anticipated fight between Trogadets, the league's reigning heavyweight champion, and a newcomer gunning for his title, a wild-eyed six-foot-six maniac named Archie Henderson. This was Henderson's rookie season, and he'd go on to accumulate 566 penalty minutes in 88 regular season in playoff games that year. But to earn his enforcer credentials in the IHL, he'd first have to deal with Trognitz. But to the fans' dismay, Trognitz and Henderson never squared off during this game. But in the IHL, the game was never over until the last drop of blood was spilled. As the game ended, Port Huron winning 4-1, Dayton's Rick Dorman and the flag's Gary Rissling resumed an earlier fight. When Trognitz, who was leaving the penalty box, rushed to join the fight along with players from both benches. In a quick order, there was a battle royal. Henderson grabbed Dayton's John Flesh by the shirt. Wild Willie, who was six feet tall and weighed 215, skated to Flesh's defense, jumped Henderson from behind, and landed five or six punches to the face, one of which broke Henderson's nose. Henderson, Flesh, and Trognitz went down in a heap, and along came Port Huron's Gary McGonagall to pull Trognitz off Henderson. Trognitz responded by delivering a savage beating to McGonagall. After that, a fatigued Trognitz skated to the Dayton bench and was talking with his coach, Nick Polano, as the officials, general managers, and police tried to get the two teams to the dressing rooms. But at that point, Henderson put down his gloves and stick, broke away from a linesman, and charged around the rink and up the boards towards Trognitz. Trognitz, exhausted from his previous two bouts, raised his stick, but that did not deter the charging Henderson. Trognitz then swung his stick at the oncoming Henderson and caught him in the forehead with the blade, splitting his forehead open. Upon seeing this bloodshed, a Port Huron fan somehow got onto the Dayton bench and slugged Trognitz in the side of the head, which caused Trognitz to fall. With Henderson dazed and bleeding, and Trognitz now dazed on the ice, 
The officials were able to corral both of them to their respective dressing rooms. Henderson needed eight stitches for his forehead and got his nose reset while also being hospitalized with a concussion. Willie explained the ugly incident this way. There is no question what I did was wrong, Trogner said. I hit him on the head with my stick and stick swinging can't be part of the game. But I'd already finished the game. I had two fights and I was exhausted. This giant lunatic charges at me, screaming, I'm going to kill you. So I reacted, figuring he'd never eat five feet of lumber to get at me. They told us before the game that Henderson was a bloody lunatic and I was just trying to get him to stop. Five days later, Wild Willie was permanently suspended, banned for a life from the International Hockey League by President William Began. The whole affair gained worldwide attention. But of course, it was the 1970s, so just four days after the lifetime ban, the World Hockey Association's Cincinnati Stingers, in dire need of an on-ice policeman, offered Willie a 10-game WHA trial. And just like that, Willie was not only back in hockey, but was promoted to the major leagues. The Stingers had begun the season as one of the WHA's most promising teams, but they won just one of their first 10 games and they were being pushed around, especially by the Birmingham Bulls, which featured a bloodthirsty quartet of Steve Psycho Durbano, Gilles Bad News Bilodeau, Frank Seldom Beaton, and Dave Killer Hansen. The Stingers countered by building their own four-goon chain gang of Trognitz, Paul Stewart, Alf Handrahan, and Bruce Gregg. The WHA had turned into a circus, and Trognitz was expected to be in the center ring. However, aside from a three-bout game versus Kurt Brackenberry at the Quebec Nordiques, Willie had no takers in his 10-game trial as opponents respected his presence on the bench and the Stinger stars were left alone. Drognitz then rejected the Stinger's offer of another 10-game trial at $150 per game and he sat out for a month. Although Stinger's head coach Jacques Demer classified Drognitz as a weak skater who does not handle the puck very well, the Stingers relented and gave Trognitz a legitimate contract for the remainder of the season. He picked up two goals in 94 penalty minutes in 29 games, while his clear lack of basic hockey playing skill was apparent to all. Clearing it into the Cincinnati zone, back to get it Ron Plum with Larry Lund after him. Now Trognitz checks Gray, and here comes Trognitz down the left wing for Cincinnati. Really is having a tough time. He finally fires it in, and it's Stewart a shot over the top of the goal. Play is called. Willie Trognitz, who uh, played in the International League, he quite was, a jump from the International League to the WHA, and he was really... Chopping the corners oh. off that puck, uh, coming out of his own zone. Uh. Trognitz would return to the minor league grind in 1978-79 in the short-lived Pacific Coast League. He was then signed to a contract by the NHL's Colorado Rockies in 1979 and spent the season with the Central Hockey League's Fort Worth Texans. Again, it was the 1970s, so... You won't be surprised to learn that his roommate and best friend on the Texans was Archie Henderson. Trognitz racked up 203 penalty minutes in 55 games and achieved his final bit of hockey notoriety in 1980 when he welcomed the eventual gold medal Miracle on Ice team to Fort Worth by slicing open Dave Christian's face just 20 seconds into the Texans exhibition with the traveling U.S. Olympic team. So at this point, you're probably wondering about the hero part of the story. Well, it goes something like this. With his last game in the books, Trognitz returned home to Thunder Bay where he began working with the Canadian Coast Guard. It was a good job for Trognitz and his fearless approach in the face of danger would come to good use on October 30, 1996. He said, when I played hockey, I beat people up for a living. Now I rescue people. His most publicized at sea rescue was the rescue of the cruise ship Grandpa Wu. Trognitz was on board the Coast Guard ship, the Westfort, when he and the rest of the crew responded to a distress call on Lake Superior. The call came in during hurricane-like weather conditions. 20-foot waves crashed across the deck of the Westfort. The below freezing October weather quickly formed ice and the crew soon faced the possibility of capsizing. For Trognitz, the night provided a legitimate fright on Halloween. He admits that he was scared for his life. He said, that was the most intense rescue I've ever been on. I honestly thought that would be my last day. We all did. We were almost rolling over. We were on our side many times. 
The boat was literally on its side. The West Fort was so top-heavy it started to roll on its side nearly 90 degrees. But despite the dangers, Trogdets and the crew pushed forward to save those on the Grandpa Wu from almost certain death. Just moments after its crew members were rescued, giant waves violently smashed the Grandpa Wu against the rocks, shattering the boat into pieces and sinking it to the bottom of the bay. That rescue earned Trognets and two other crew members the Governor General's Medal of Bravery. With Willie Trognets enshrined as a Canadian hero and Archie Henderson continuing a successful career as an NHL scout, it reminds us once again that if you want the job done right, hire a hockey enforcer. Check out another video of a hockey goon turned life-saving hero.